Welcome to the Solo Mo Show, a weekly podcast hosted by Corey O'Brien, the social media strategist at Heat and author of TheFutureOfAds.com. And I'm Adam Helway, CEO of the digital marketing agency Secret Sushi Creative. Each episode, we discuss topics, trends, tactics, and tools related to social, local, and mobile marketing and advertising. Our goal is to give you the information you need to be a better marketer. Today is Tuesday, May 7th, 2013, and this is episode number 16. In this episode, we're going to discuss stats about Pinterest, Instagram's new photo of you feature, Taco Bell using Snapchat for marketing, and much more. So how's it going this week, Adam? It's going all right. Um, hopefully be in a new place uh, here in the next week or something like that. I've got the month to, to move from one place to the other, but you know, I can't just moving is, it, it takes a lot of energy out of, you know, trying to decide how to get yourself into a place without sort of being in halfway between one and the other, uh, especially when you have more time. It's like if you know you need to get out on a weekend, you'll do everything possible in that time to just hurry up and get all your friends and get a truck and move it. But I'm basically paying one more month on the rent and paying the, the first month on the new place. So it's like, oh, OK, I got time. And then it just drags out. It's like pulling a tooth. How about you? How are you doing? I'm doing all right. It's been a busy couple weeks. I've just been chugging away work stuff and, uh, you know, getting solo mo, all that stuff ready. So it has been a busy one, but, you know, a lot of fun stuff, a lot of fun projects going on. So busy in a good way. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, and, and summer is coming up here in California. Weather's getting nicer, all that, that good thing, uh, good things. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, a few things happening here and there. Uh, uh, we're trying to, pick out some of the things that were interesting us for this week's episode. What do we got on deck first? First up is the ending of an era, which is Adobe killing the Creative Suite off. Creative Suite 6 will be the last Creative Suite that Adobe ever releases. But fear not for those of you Adobe users, they're actually moving to the Creative Cloud, which is basically still just Creative Suite, but you pay by the month or by the year instead of buying the application outright. I uh, thought this was more of just a, you know, an interesting news item. Um, you know, a lot of our listeners, maybe you, you don't use Adobe products directly, but more than likely somebody on your team is using it to, you know, create imagery, that sort of thing that's going up on your social channel. So, you know, more of an interesting side note for people that are maybe involved in smaller agencies, that sort of thing. I actually see this as potentially being beneficial because I think that the challenge with Creative Suite is always like you had to treat it as this golden goose and like if a new employee came on, you're like, oh, are we going to give them, you know, a Creative Suite? It was such like a, a heavy investment and you'd, you'd have to like, you know, ration out your Creative Suite licenses and with month to month, you could actually like scale it up. So you're like, okay, well, this month we're going to have a couple extra freelancers helping out. You just get them a month long copy of Creative Suite. They use it. You know, the project concludes and then, hey, it, at the end of the month, you you stop paying for that and away it goes. So I think it'll give a little more flexibility, though. There were a lot of people that were like, damn you, Adobe, you will not take my Creative Suite because they're probably running like Creative Suite 3 that they've had for, you know, 10 years. And, you know, it gets, <laughs> it gets a job done. But uh, but maybe they were they were hoping to hold on to that for a little while longer. So I actually think this is going to be beneficial for some of the competition as well. I think we've talked about Pixelmator. Uh, that's the application that I use a lot for my sort of lighter photo retouching. And you know, I think this is a good news for them because, you know, Adobe's Creative Cloud, it's going to run 50 bucks a month. So for basically the cost of one month of Adobe's platform, you can buy Pixelmator and all the updates and all the fun stuff that comes with that. So for now, for now, exactly. But <laughs> yeah, maybe they're uh, they're going to follow suit and call the Pixelmator cloud, have that on the way. But, you know, for now, there I think there'll be alternatives that'll fill in for the people that do want a more economical option. And hey, if your agency is based off of using Adobe, then uh, the 50 bucks a month probably pales in comparison to the money that you're getting back from using it. So I think this is potentially good all around. A lot of people are doing the math or saying, hey, I, if I'm updating Adobe every year, I'm probably actually going to pay less this way. So, you know, what initially seemed like, oh, they're just trying to, to screw us over it actually might end up for a lot of people, meaning that you're paying less on a yearly basis. So Seems like some interesting news, uh, especially for those people who are sort of involved in the creation of imagery and photos and all that stuff that uses Adobe on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Uh, I would add that it really changes the paradigm a little bit in regards to how a major, you know, major software. I mean, the, the, I've been using Adobe products. I, don't, I mean, you know, Photoshop now is at Photoshop something like, I don't know, 12 or four, 14 or something. If you really knew what the numbers were before they started using CS123 and so on. Uh, and they're up to, you know, CS6 essentially before they've made this current transition. I've been using it since like Photoshop 4, um, you know, way, way back in the day. And um, so that's why it's really funny nowadays with people talking about how much they spend on apps and they call them apps and apps are, you know, five bucks, 10 bucks, 99 cents, whatever they may be. And some of the apps a little bit more in say, for instance, the Apple app store, maybe the, the, you know, Google play store. We were used to for a long, long time paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars for apps. Um, and so, you know, the pricing obviously is, is an issue, uh, but the paradigm changes when instead of waiting two years for a major feature to be released and not being able to use that feature unless you upgrade, that now you essentially have uh, Adobe has an opportunity to quickly iterate and rapidly iterate on their product to a point where rather than um, having utilizing new features once every one or two years, you're able to do it once every one or two months when they release some new feature that is, you know, cool and addresses an issue that's happening in the industry right then and there. So it'll be smaller stuff pushed quicker. Um, and, and that sort of in a way also is, is a reason why paying monthly makes sense for Adobe and the whole sort of cloud based uh, system. And cloud is, is very much related to a lot of the other stuff too, that we talk about on the show. So, you know, this is uh, following suit with some of those other stories as well. All right, well, let's dive into our stats of the week. And yet again, we are looking at statistics provided by Digiday.com. At this point, if you are not subscribed to Digiday.com, you're probably missing out because it's uh, just a great source of information. And this week, they took a look at 15 stats retailers should know about Pinterest. Uh, So Pinterest is, you know, I I think still a, a hot social channel. Uh, maybe it hasn't been in the news as much lately as it was in its prime, but you know maybe that means it's it's growing into itself a little bit. It's established itself. Uh, so a couple interesting things to pick out. Um, as of February, Pinterest has 25 million users. That's according to Business Insider. So good size audience, not hundreds of millions. You know, not approaching Facebook's billions, but still 25 million users. That's I would say pretty strong. 70% of brand engagement on Pinterest is generated by users, not brands. So definitely, you know, users are are sharing products. It's a very brand friendly place. Uh, which is something that I've said for quite a while, and I, I kind of like that about Pinterest. You know, you, you have to walk a fine line on Facebook of how promotional can we be. Pinterest is all about shopping and comparing products and, and sharing products and information. And, uh, you know, they even say that pins that include prices receive 36% more likes than those that do not. So you don't have to shy away from pricing. You don't have to shy away from, you know, being very specific about, hey, check out these products. Uh, So I like that in terms of what brands can do to make use of Pinterest. Did uh, any of these numbers from the Digiday post stand out to you, Adam? I think I'm actually a little bit surprised for some reason due to the fanfare, I guess, of of Pinterest and other things that I thought 25 million would be, you know, there'd be more than 25 million users at this uh, at this point. I think it wasn't long ago, you know, we started doing the Solo Mo Show a bit, you know, a year ago or so. Uh, We were talking about them rapidly, I think, going to like, say, 10 million users. So, I mean, I guess... But I, I, when you compare them to some of the other social networks, I just had an expectation that there would likely be more active users at, at this time. I think it's interesting that they say the best time for retailers and fashion brands to pin is Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern. So, you know, there's a, a lot of folks that are checking out Pinterest, I guess, for ideas and maybe throughout the weekend. Obviously, that's where they dig in. Uh, to, to that sort of thing. So those were the ones that initially you know, stood out the, the most to me. I, I will say that, uh, interestingly enough, because we're going from, say, we talked about this at the opening of the show, that we're moving from an apartment to an actual uh, house, uh, to an actual three-bedroom house with backyard and all that sort of thing. And that's different. You've suddenly got a place where you can do some gardening in the back and some landscaping and other things. You've got one unit you can mess with. And one of the places that we sort of like was a go-to place for, for my wife and I to go to was Pinterest to go get ideas. 
it, it really does have a wealth of information that many other places don't. I would say it's funny enough is like YouTube and Pinterest, those together you can give you a lot of ideas on what you could do to improve things or what to buy or how to fix things and all that sort of thing. That is pretty interesting. You know, I think it's it's a social network that has a very specific user base and at least in the near term probably isn't going to grow outside of that. And and what they do is they target definitely a more adult user and especially, you know, parents and homeowners or people that are sort of investing in the place that they live. I don't I don't think it works as well if you're, you know, renting and you maybe have some restrictions on the types of things you can do to change your home, but uh, it actually said that um, Pinterest share of referrals is highest in home and furnishing, account for accounting for up to 60% of all social traffic. So, you know, if you're a home with, you know, furniture or that sort of thing. You have a product you're selling in the home, you know, all that sort of thing, right? Exactly. You're going to see up to 60% of your social traffic coming from Pinterest, which is incredibly strong. So, you know, yes, 25 million users, maybe not the largest number, but that's 25 million adult users that are, you know, homeowners. They've, they've got some expendable household income. I think that also leads to sort of this average amount per order. So they said the average Pinterest shopper ends up with between $140 to $180 per order compared to $80 for Facebook and $60 for Twitter shoppers. So, you know, again, I think it's a higher higher income for the typical Pinterest user. It's somebody that's definitely a little bit older, so probably has a little bit more of that expendable income. So, you know, not right for every brand, but if it is right for you, then you should definitely be paying strong attention to Pinterest. Yeah, agreed, agreed. So speaking of interesting moves from social networks, our main topic for today is a new feature coming out of Instagram, which though not the biggest change in the world, I think has some pretty significant implications for brands. And we're talking about photos of you. And not just you, Adam, photos of everyone. But they have Oh, new- darn, <laughs> darn. I thought that was the new, the new feature was photos of Adam. But, uh, <laughs> everyone gets to look at photos of Adam, exactly. <laughs> so it's a pretty simple concept. Basically, you know, you've already got captions for photos and that sort of answers the you know what is in this photo you've got geo data that answers the where but previously the only way to answer the who of who's in the photo was to actually include the name of that user in the caption it wasn't a very elegant solution you know it kind of worked it alerted that person like hey i took a photo of you but it stayed on your own profile there was no way of saying you know tag this person and then when somebody looks at that person they can also see my photo So what Photos of You does is allows you to actually tag specific users in your photo. So when you upload the photo, you can tap on that person's face and you can type their username and it'll run a search and say, you know, is this the right, uh, the right Adam or the right John that you're looking for? And you say, yes, it is. And then it sends them a notification says, hey, you've been tagged in a photo and they have the option of either automatically approving all of those and then if needed, coming back and removing some or you can actually approve every single one before that tag goes public. Uh, But what's interesting is not only is this applicable to individual users, but any account. And so for brands that have set up Instagram accounts, that's their brand name. Uh, You know, let's use Coca-Cola, for example. If I had a Coca-Cola in my photo, I could take a picture of that and actually tag that item as Coca-Cola, and then it would show up on their account. That's where the interesting stuff happens, in my mind. Exactly. That's where the interesting stuff is. So it's not just, you know, okay, cool, you know, I I can get tags. It's actually adding content to your own account, which I think for a lot of brands is a struggle. You're like, you know, I've got to, I've got to take and post all my own photos. It's hard to build out my account. It would be a lot easier if I could let my fans sort of contribute to this process. And so there were actually tools that were starting to spring up. There were the equivalent of like the retweet tool for Instagram, where it actually takes somebody's photo and reposts it. And that was always kind of clunky, like it didn't do a great job of attribution, and it was sort of a photo within a photo, it was very strange. So I think this is a much more fluid process, and also just a great way for brands to build out a lot of imagery to kind of bring their profile to life. Um, So I, you know, I, I think this could be great for contests. I think this is something that every brand should be, you know, recognizing and saying to their fans, hey, we'd love if you guys took pictures of us, make sure you tag it, we want it to show up in our profile, you know, maybe find some way of incentivizing that early on, saying, hey, the first 20 people are going to get something cool from us, that sort of thing. 
you know, I think this is potentially a really beneficial feature for brands and something that a lot of brands should be taking advantage of and uh, either taking advantage of or it'll be streamlining things that they're already trying to do with, you know, Instagram contests and that sort of thing. You know, is this a feature that you see yourself either using personally or, or recommending to clients, Adam? Yeah, I mean, I, I keep thinking of folks, uh, sort of the, the ones that stand out the most to me are celebrities or, or, you know, entertainment acts. So folks that you, I mean, just imagine going to like a Justin Bieber concert. Imagine, imagine, Corey. I'm picturing uh, it. And, <laughs> it's terrible, and but I'm picturing it. I know, I know. Just, uh, you've got your, you've got your earplugs on, so you can't actually see the, hear the music. But, uh, You've got Justin Bieber, he's singing it, and then everybody in the audience has got their mobile phone, of course, and they've taken photos of him, and then they're uploading it to Instagram, and now they can tag him uh, directly on that Instagram photo, and then uh, it could be this sort of aggregate of all these, um, uh, of all these, you know, photos of Justin Bieber and that don't have to necessarily be uh, connected. Previously, I think, as you mentioned, you know, they don't have to be connected directly to a, a location because of course you could say hey i'm at this you know i'm at the shoreline amphitheater or something like that but then that that becomes part of everybody else at the shoreline amphitheater and and uh, the other way to sort of pull everything together would be to use a hashtag and then that sort of becomes a little loosey-goosey as well uh it's not also as easily known by folks like for instance justin bieber or his group of, of marketing folks uh can't easily sort of uh, um point people in that direction to check out that content or, or aggregate that content uh, well for everybody else to discover unless they have some sort of signpost on their account that says, go check out this particular hashtag from the show. But now fans can go to Justin Bieber's account and not only see what he shared, but see everybody's aggregate content with a photo of him in it. You know, um, There's, of course, going to be those folks that ta- tag people that aren't in photos, uh, I had it happen immediately. I have my little, I got my cousins who uh, who are like, you know, 15, 16 years old, They'll play with Instagram a little bit. And the other day, suddenly I see that I've got, I've been tagged in a photo and I'm not in it. Yeah. Uh, and I've, that's happened on Facebook as well. And I, you know, just to grab your attention. Uh, and that can be kind of annoying. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that everything from the, from the whole sort of a celebrity and entertainer event thing down to almost in a way product placement um, sort of uh, either would be with celebrities or, or individuals sharing what, you know, I'm, I'm thinking like a can of Red Bull or Coke or, uh, or some clothing or, or something like that and tagging it in there. I can see that there could be a lot of use. I will say that I think that the use for that, for tagging in general, can really take off when they do it in a way like, Foursquare does where Foursquare knows who you're connected to on Facebook. And even though you, the people on the people that are on Facebook or you're connected with on Facebook may not have a Foursquare account because you're connecting to Facebook, you can actually tag people as being with you in a particular location only by, by, by Facebook account. So what I'm, what I mean by that is my wife, for instance, is not on Foursquare, but she's on Facebook. And because the accounts are connected, I can actually say that this particular person is with me, my wife, and it will show me her Facebook icon and profile via Foursquare inside the Foursquare app and allow me to tag her in in there. In Instagram, currently, the only way to tag somebody is if they have an Instagram account Mm -hmm. And and the connections on Instagram are far fewer than they are on Facebook. And so if, when you have the opportunity to sort of tag people who are not yet on Instagram but are connected connections with Facebook, considering the fact that Instagram is owned by Facebook right now, uh, I think that's where some really fun and interesting things can happen where uh, it increases awareness of, of things beyond the borders of Instagram. Um, and people who aren't using Instagram also suddenly are sort of privy to the fact that it exists and are aware of it because maybe they're notified via Facebook that they were tag- tagged in a photo or something like that. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think that makes sense. And, you know, I think the the Facebook analogy is great. Uh, Facebook recently bought Instagram. And, you know, I think we're all familiar with this type of tagging because Facebook's been doing it for a long time. If you go to your own Facebook profile, there's the section of photos that you upload. And then there's also this photos of you inside of Facebook, which is photos that other people have tagged. And it, it makes a lot of sense. It's a, you know, very intuitive way. It's sort of like, you know, when I look back at my own vacation photos, 
I'm never in my own vacation photos because I'm taking pictures of everything around me. <laughs> and so it's weird. You don't get a lot of photos of yourself, but other people are doing the same thing, but they're taking pictures of you and not themselves. So you kind of tag your friends, they tag you, and suddenly everybody's profile gets built out a little more than it normally would. So, you know, I think this uh, this is very intuitive. I think brands will sort of naturally use it, but I also think that users will naturally use it, which is nice. You don't have to explain it very, very much. Uh, Instagram has made it a prominent feature of the upload process. It's right there. It's actually above the geotagging now, so you can't miss it. You're like, oh, what's this? You tap it. It walks you through the whole process. Uh, and I think, you know, even just the example that I gave, if you took a photo and, you know, it's your friend holding up a, a can of Coke, you might actually tag that just to be like, oh, you know, this is this is a Coke or this is a whatever. You know, people are definitely starting to tag like fashion and luxury brands, that sort of thing. So uh, I think this is something that brands would be smart to adopt quickly. And like I said, maybe, you know, incentivize early users or just try to build awareness and say, hey, we would actually really appreciate if, you know, the next time you were at our restaurant, tag that restaurant so we can add it to our own account or any any kind of example like that. I think it works for all sorts of businesses. It doesn't have to be a product. It could be, you know, hey, if you take a picture in front of our storefront, tag the storefront with our name, that sort of thing. Uh, so, you know, definitely something to check out. Uh, we'll include a link in the show notes to find out a little more if you want to, you know, see screenshots of what the whole process looks like. Uh, but you know, cool feature coming out of Instagram. I like what they did there. All right. So with that, shall we dive into the lightning round today? You, 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 you did it differently today. There were you, 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 I think you looked up and realized that we were already in the lightning round. Is that what it was? Uh, it was more of a drum roll, but, uh, yes, I, I, I missed out on my classic lightning round sound. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it's time for the lightning round. All let's right, do let's do it. We got 60 seconds on the clock, and let's dive right into story number one. Ready and go. So Facebook, speaking of Facebook, since they seem to be the hot topic today, Facebook came out and claimed that 40% of top grossing iOS and Android applications used ads on their platform to juice downloads, which I think is interesting for two reasons. One, you know, what are they even talking about that for? It's sort of like a, a humble brag. They're like, oh, check out all these apps that use our platform. Uh, so, you know, good for them. 40% is a, a, a incredibly strong number. It's basically signaling that if you want to be a top mobile app, you've got to use Facebook as a way of getting users. But I think that that's also an interesting message for, you know, mobile developers and just the Facebook ad platform in general. These are big companies with big budgets. They're trying to get millions of users. And so it's driving up the cost of an ad, which I think could potentially start to price out some of the smaller players in the space. And, you know, whether or not that that comes to be, we'll have to see. But I think it's an interesting implication long term. All right, Adam, 60 seconds on the clock. What's your take on this announcement out of Facebook? Ready and go. Uh, I think it's funny you're talking about the humble brag thing. Facebook was also talking recently about uh, sort of being a part of, you know, they they, re they revamped, and we talked about on the show here, where they revamped the way that their mobile API works to provide sort of a cleaner experience. So that's one of the things that they did. And additionally, they talked about uh, many of the apps in the App Store, many of the top apps in the App Store using Facebook as some part of the thing, whether it be single sign-on or something like that. So in this case, what they're talking about is what they're calling the the app install ads, mobile app install ads, where it's directly in the mobile stream that you don't see this on a desktop where it actually says, hey, here's this mobile app you might be interested in, tap here, and you can go ahead immediately and install it. And that's obviously a dynamic that isn't really possible or viable via a desktop. Uh, and so uh, for mobile app developers, uh, it's definitely a, a way to go, very similar to what Zynga did to make their platform thrive on the desktop. All right, well timed, right at the buzzer there, finish it up. All right, let's dive into our second story of the day. We've only got two, so this will be our last lightning round topic for today. Ready and go. Well, you knew it had to happen. Somebody had to be the first brand to jump onto Snapchat in a big way. And officially, Taco Bell takes the crown as Run the... for the border. <laughs> Taco Bell runs for the border and Snapchat's along the way. Uh, no, they... <laughs> So they announced, you know, they said, hey, we're now on Snapchat. Everybody should follow us and uh, and we'll communicate through you in that way. Uh, and so, you know, they did. People apparently followed Taco Bell on Snapchat and they posted a picture of their beefy, crunchy burrito, which was apparently, 
I think they said it was either a popular item for people to Snapchat anyways, which I find kind of interesting. Uh, but I think they also said it was a popular item within their target demographic of Snapchat users. So, you know, younger people apparently love that beefy, crunchy burrito. Uh, I think it's interesting. I think, you know, there there's potentially a larger application or a larger marketing play here at Snapchat that they didn't take advantage of. They actually only marketed to friends, but still interesting to see somebody do it first. All right, Adam, 60 seconds on the clock. What's your take on Taco Bell's Snapchat use? Ready and go. So I, I think it's interesting. I didn't see the, the details of it, and, and and I'm not really a heavy Snapchat chat user. I mean, Snapchat users are, are the sort of teen demographic, young, young, young adult demographic, same folks that might be that are likely re, uh, relying on SMS for their messaging versus, say, something like email. Um, and so in, in the app itself, you know, normally it's friend to friend, but in the app itself, at least in the settings, it seems like the, you might be able to say, anybody can send me snaps instead of only friends, which sort of opens up the gates for brands to play around, take advantage. Uh, it sort of also makes sense that Taco Bell likely being a place for those same, that same age group to go out after, you know, a Friday night or a weekend or something like that to go eat w- w- would make sense. So, uh, I, I'm not connected with, with Taco Bell and I'm not on Snapchat at the moment. So we'll see if they can make anything happen, but they're experimenting, right? Exactly. We haven't used that motto in a while. Always be experimenting. Our uh, our our subtitle we, for the show. And we mean we mean with this the technology, not the food Taco Bell. <laughs> exactly. Please. Do not experiment with the beefy crunchy burrito. It may yeah, exactly. side effects may vary. <laughs> So, Adam, I think we we're going to close out the show with a quick action item. And this is something that you had surfaced. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about YouTube Trends Map. Uh, sure. I was trying to, and I, and I, and I, I think I may have only checked it out uh, superficially because I was really trying to see uh, how to manipulate it and so on. But Google is has sort of released this new tool on their site called Trends Map. If you go to youtube.com slash Trends Map, uh, it gives you a lot of ways. It's sort of this interactive, interactive infographics in a way, um, where you can play with the data and chop it up in a lot of different ways. When you initially get there, it asks, it shows you by by gender, age, uh, type of of uh, sort of whether it be shares or views, uh, and then it's primarily the U.S. at the moment. I don't think there's any way to see other otherwise, um, but it will actually show you what sort of videos uh, or what videos are being viewed or shared uh, from, from YouTube. So uh, you can, and, and it does it by location. So you can see like, you know, throughout California, where are people sharing throughout the, the East coast and in between. Um, so I found it sort of interesting to see what was on the minds of folks at this given time. Um, I saw that I was, I was a little bit surprised to see that it seemed like Alan Jackson, for instance, right now, uh, has a video of him performing, and I don't know exactly where where it's from, or if it's from a concert or, or what, uh, or you know, a late night show, a late night appearance. But it, it seems to be the hot thing going on right now across the U.S. Um, and so I think you'd be surprised to see sort of regionally where some of the content is trending, uh, and that you're able to see that trending happening. Um, I'm not sure if it's exactly in real time. Uh, or well, let's just see videos uploaded within 48 hours may not appear and age and gender breakdowns. So again, I don't know if it's, if it's uh, 24 hours or, or what that it takes for it to show up here, but it's a cool place to kind of come and chop up the data and see what is sort of on the pulse of people and maybe discover content, whether it be discover content you want to share or discover content you want to hitch the ride on that sort of thing, um, become part of that meme that's happening, whatever the case may be. It's a place to sort of check and see what's on the pulse of the of the U.S. YouTube viewer. Yeah, I think the thing that's especially interesting for me, at least, and it might just be right now how different it is, but they've got uh, bars for both male and female and just seeing how different the top videos for those two groups are. Uh, you know, for me, the top female is a Blake Shelton music video. Uh, so, you know, a lot of Blake Shelton fans are female. They want to check that out. They want to watch that. Maybe they've got it on repeat at the office or something like that. 
And then for guys, it's the Charles Ramsey Cleveland Missing Teen Story. It was sort of this guy who, you know, he found these abducted teens. The story itself is very sad, but the guy was very eccentric, and the video is kind of crazy, and there's already remixes popping up. It's, it's essentially become an overnight meme. Uh, but it's a meme driven almost entirely by the male demographic. You know, you see a ton of guys watching the video, but, you know, for all intent and purposes, girls are like, nah, forget that. I, you know, I don't really care. So just interesting <laughs> to see the types of, uh, types of videos that resonate with one audience or another. Uh, and speaking of which, there's a little bit of an Easter egg. It's kind of funny. If you click in the FAQs, the very last question they address is, Why is blank video so popular with 13 to 17 year old females? And the answer given by Google is no one will ever know dot, dot, dot. So I don't know how long that's actually, that that feels like something that like a a developer kind of snuck in there and some, you know, Google corporate bigwig is going to be like, whoa, we cannot say that in a public place. But for now, at least they acknowledge the fact that like, you know, the things that, that young female viewers watch sometimes boggles the mind, but you know, it's interesting to just kind of, again, see the types of topics This maybe could help inform some of your own content strategy. So if you're a business that targets an older demographic or a younger demographic, just check out the types of videos that resonate with that audience. And, you know, maybe it'll help frame up some of your own media, some of the, you know, the messaging that you're putting out there, the the style of messaging that you want to use. So fun to play around with, fun to kind of manipulate the data. There's actually a couple of different tools in addition to just the map. They've got this dashboard where you can load in different demographics and compare them so uh, again we'll include a link to this in the show notes available at solomoshow.com but we encourage you to check this out and play around with it if if for nothing else than just a a fun way of visualizing some of the data that normally gets presented in a rather boring chart this is a much more interactive and exciting way to view this type of trend data All right, well, we covered a lot of great stuff this week, and there is plenty more to think about as these stories unfold. But as always, if you have a question for us, if you want to suggest a topic, if you want to give us feedback, or hey, even if you just want to say hello, we encourage you to do that. We love to get in touch with our listeners, hear about what you're interested in, what's got you excited, and you know maybe even what we might be able to cover in future episodes. So if you'd like to do that, there's a couple of ways of reaching us. The first and probably easiest is via Twitter. We are both available at Solomo Show, or I'm available directly at Corey O'Brien. And I'm at Secret Sushi. You can also email us. We have a Gmail account. It's S-O-L-O-M-O-S-H-O-W at gmail.com. That's Show at gmail.com. We're also on Facebook where we share things in between shows, uh, stuff that we might not get a chance to cover during the show. So we'd love if you go over there, like us, and start uh, taking a look at what we've got. And you can, of course, contribute the comments there. Uh, we also have a Google Plus account and a Pinterest account where we have our episodes up there yes you can pin youtube videos so you can actually uh, repin our episodes and share them with others to your heart's delight there you go in case you don't have a pen and paper handy all of the links that we just mentioned can be found in the show notes which again are available at solomoshow.com or in your podcast player of choice And we haven't mentioned this in a while, so we'll mention it this episode. If you could, go ahead and give us a rating inside of iTunes. It helps us to reach new listeners, discover a new audience, and help a new audience discover us. So if you could... That's what we're going to say. It helps us reach new heights. Reach new heights, exactly. (laughs) Taking us to the top. Uh, But if you do get value out of the show, you know, it just takes a couple of minutes to rate it inside of iTunes, and that would definitely help us out, and we would greatly appreciate it. So make sure to do that if you haven't already. And with that, we will call this episode a wrap. But we hope you come back next week to join us for another great episode of The Solo Mo Show. Take care.